I believe there is a buzz around group singing now that there hasn't been for many years. You become a part of a group with so many other people just as equally as passionate and dedicated to something that you're doing as you are. You don't have to be a great soloist to, to excel at it. There's a place in a choir for anybody. For those who have been uh, squashed as a youngster, I'd say don't believe it. Uh, take a chance and give us a try. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Earth and Humanity Foundation, Wendy Selden, Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration among the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op, Cliff Bar and Company, Elizabeth York, and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities, solutions to all kinds of challenges. Do you sing in your car along with the radio or a smartphone or walking down the street or doing the dishes or maybe in the quiet privacy of the shower? Do you sing with other people? If you do, you're part of a movement that's lighting up millions of lives and strengthening both individual relationships and communities. There are obvious limitations to using words to describe this, this power of music, but some do a pretty good job describing this marvelous world. And I think we all know this world. I think our bodies are experiencing it all the time. They're experiencing it right now. We just tend to cover it up with a layer of words, ideas, thoughts about who we are or who we should be. But words are really flimsy messengers for the fullness of experience. And singing can bring us here. So my simple hope is that we'll sing more, that we'll sing our way into the world of our bodies and into the body of the world. This feels more important than ever. There are a lot of people who agree with Will Hewitt on that, and we're going to meet some of them tonight. We begin with Rob Griswell Lowry, director of the Rogue Valley Peace Choir in Southern Oregon, and Roberta Kaiser, one of its longtime members. Welcome to you both. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Roberta, let me ask you first, what was the origin of the choir? How did it come together? A member of the Eugene Peace Choir moved down here and went to Dave Marston with the idea of having a peace choir here. And he was receptive, and it started in September of 2003. We like to think of ourselves as ambassadors for peace. And what we offer is feelings of peace and love for our world and caring for our planet and hope for social justice. Now, not to try to turn this into a controversial show or anything like that, but I do wonder if this sparks, if being in the choir and being with other people sparks interesting conversations about politics and what's going on in the world, and if sometimes you hear some opinions that you wouldn't necessarily expect from Peace Choir members. We sometimes talk about uh, political kinds of events. Um, I think uh, for the most part we're a diverse group and we agree mostly on peace for our planet. Well, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, Rob, you came to the Peace Choir not long ago, last year I believe. Actually, uh, three years ago. Three years ago. What's the power of singing within the context of activism? Well, singing reaches people uh, under the radar, so to speak, more so even than orating or talking to people. Uh, you reach a, at a very deep level a person's uh, psyche when you sing or make music, and then I think that uh, gives the message uh, more deeply. What is the process for joining the choir? Uh, we accept choir members uh, throughout the year. Uh, we have a non-audition period in September where anyone can join of any uh, musical ability. Uh, then as the year progresses, we need to audition people uh, and they need to be better musicians so that they can catch up with the choir. We spend the whole year learning repertoire each year. Mm -hmm. And I imagine there's a diversity of skill and experience within people who come to the choir. Is that a challenge to manage, having people who are 
maybe beginners not really that musically attuned to having some expert singers? Or is, does it ever get awkward, or is it pretty matter of fact? Well, I'd say it's a matter of fact. We prepare for that by uh, each summer we make a learning CD for uh, each of the choir members' voice part. So that's a total of eight CDs. And everybody uh, gets that CD along with the music at the beginning of the year to learn their part with. Now, I can just about guarantee that we have one or more viewers right now, maybe those people who, like me, were told by music teachers in elementary school to sing more softly, who uh, are intrigued by this but think they might be embarrassed if they came out and tried, tried out for a choir. What would you say to them? Well, the first thing I'd say is that we all have the equipment to sing within our physical bodies. There are harps, there's a harp coiled up in each ear, and the physics of it are that we, anyone can sing, but uh, for those who have been uh, squashed as a youngster, I'd say don't believe it, uh, take a chance and give us a try. Uh, we're a very welcoming and committed group of people and it's really more about singing for a purpose than it is uh, singing to be the most beautiful singer in the world. Roberta, can you think of people who came in really tentatively and a little bit scared because they were squashed as kids, perhaps? Yes. And how did they develop? You know, slowly, but we, it's with encouragement, and we have a lot of fun in the Peace Choir, so I think that that gets people relaxed right off the bat. Back in 2006, members of the Peace Choir went to Japan on a special mission. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. The goal was for a peace journey for the 61st anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And when they returned, I think that all of us were profoundly impacted by their journey. And um, of note, Dave Marston, while he was there, composed a song and sang it in the Peace Park. And it was titled, From America to Hiroshima, and it was a song of apology. How were people received in Japan, do you know? Very well, very courteous, uh, loved. And they kept telling them, you don't need to apologize. And I think it developed some friendships and contacts that last till today, yes? Absolutely. And some of those Japanese uh, folks have come here to visit us. Roberta, when it's all said and done, why has your experience in the choir been so important to you? You know, I love to sing all my whole life. And I really enjoy these Peace Choir songs. They're very inspiring. And I like the fact that our choir sings at so many events throughout the year and to such a variety of audiences. But I have to say the most important aspect for me is the people, the community of friends that we sing with, that we get to know so well. We, um, we work on committees together. We practice in our sections together. We have parties and potlucks and talent shows. We've traveled to Eugene and Portland and Seattle together. And um, we're just, it's just a great group of people. What is the immense possibility of activities like the Peace Choir? I believe that the Peace Choir movement is just that. It's a movement. Uh, Peace Choirs are springing up all over. I'm continually hearing of this Peace Choir in Reading that I never heard of or a Peace Choir in San Jose that I never heard of. Uh, and for me, I think what it is, is that people really do want to sing and commune, be in community about something that really matters and what matters more for our future than a peaceful world for our kids. Rob, you and Roberta have offered to sing a song for us along with a couple other choir members. Who are they and what are you going to sing? They are Elizabeth Bingham and David Teagarden and we're going to sing a song called Salaam. It's a, uh, it's a song written in three languages by an Israeli, uh, Moshe Ben Ari, uh, sung in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. That sounds terrific. Stay with us. I believe there is buzz around group singing now that there hasn't been for many years. It's less about the X Factor voice and more about the many voices together. There's a team dynamic that, that obviously isn't there with one voice. Even if someone feels uncomfortable about singing out loud, 
to be part of a team in the choir will be very supportive. The choir is not only about music, it's also about making friends, relationships with other people. And what we're finding is lots of people, you know, they come along and they're making friends for life. Rob Griswell Lowry and members of the Rogue Valley Peace Choir. Bring peace is on our shoulders. Bring peace is on our shoulders. Bring peace is on our shoulders on everyone. Bring peace is on our shoulders. Bring peace is on our shoulders. Bring peace is on our shoulders on everyone. Salam for us and for all of the world. Salam, 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 for us and for all of the world. Salam, salam. Wajbale nanak najib, wajbale nanak najib, wajbale nanak najib, ah, salam. Wajibale nanak najib, wajibale nanak najib, wajibale nanak najib, ah, salam, salam, le nawale kula alem, salam, 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 le nawale kula alem. Salem, Salem. Ojibo Shalom Aleinu. Ojibo Shalom Aleinu. Ojibo Shalom Aleinu. Be'akulam. Ojibo Shalom Aleinu. Ojibo Shalom Aleinu. Ojibo Shalom Aleinu. Be'akulam. Salam. Aleinu ve'akol ha'olam, shalom, salam, salam. Aleinu ve'akol ha'olam, shalom, salam, salam. Uh, members of the Rogue Valley Peace Choir, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And please stay with us because in a moment, producer Dustin Fuentes will be back with another set of fiercely dedicated community singers. We keep in mind that music education needs be, to be for everybody, not just the most talented students, but anybody that has an interest in it, anybody that has a love for it. And with choral music, it's a really easy way in because you don't have to be a great soloist to, to excel at it. There's a place in a choir for anybody. When venturing into the world of singing, one group who can't be overlooked is the Rogue Valley Chorale Association, whose adult chorale and youth choruses have been spreading the joy of singing for over four decades. We're joined today by Lori Ann Hunter, who is the artistic director of the chorale, Pam Nordquist, who is the youth ensemble director, and Cabria Cara, who is currently a member of the chorale. Ladies, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Happy to be here. Lori, why was the Rogue Valley Chorale started and what were some of its initial goals? It was started 42 years ago by founding director Lynn Sholand, who was at the time teaching choirs at the only Medford High School. And um, a number of his former students, after they'd graduated, didn't have a place to sing. Uh, and they went to Lynn and asked if he could start uh, a community choir. And we now refer to those ladies as the founding mothers of the Rogue Valley Chorale. And that happened uh, 42 years ago. What about chorale singing makes it unique and maybe sets it apart from other forms of performance? I think what is unique about choral singing is that uh, it can involve people from all walks of life and all uh, ability levels. You can have people with very fine voices singing next to people who have no training at all and yet what we produce is something very harmonious and unified and is exciting for everybody. Is choral singing maybe better suited for those who maybe aren't as interested in the limelight? 
Possibly. I actually read an article recently about somebody who uh, preferred to be the person who sat in the back and uh, sang as quietly as possible. And, uh, but for her, she talked about in the article how it just it made her happy. And there are scientific studies that actually have proven that singing releases endorphins and, and makes us happier people. It begins with community service. It's so great for our students to learn about being members of a society and to bring the culture to the people of that community. It's a really great thing for students to learn that and take it, and they will continue to do that, hopefully, for their entire lives. You know, there was also a study done by the Chorus America Foundation that showed that singing in a choir was the most popular form of participation in the performing arts, that something like 42 million people in America sing in a choir, and that it also showed that singing in a choir is strongly correlated with qualities associated with success and greater civic involvement. Cabria, you're currently a member of the Chorale, but you started off in the youth chorus. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with both the groups and how it's sort of affected you as an individual. Well, for me, I actually started singing with Pam Nordquist back in high school, and she wrote me into that youth ensemble, and I just kind of flourished in that group. I mean, I really got better at singing, I became a better musician, and she hooked me up with Lori Hunter to get some private lessons, and when Lori asked me to come back and join the chorale, I really couldn't say no. I just love singing in the groups and singing with them. You become a part of a group with so many other people just as equally as passionate and dedicated to something that you're doing as you are. And beyond that, it also feeds your soul, and I think that's as important as feeding your body. <laughs> Pam, working with youth, I mean, it means I'm, I'm imagining a lot of energy in the rehearsal room. How do you keep a group of youth, energized youth, motivated and focused on singing? One of the most important parts of that is quality literature. If you put good music out there, students are going to really raise to whatever bar that you place. If you keep the bar really high and you keep um, a collaborative-based uh, rehearsal process, students are going to really rise to that occasion. They love uh, the excellence that comes from uh, a strong commitment and great singing. How many youth ensembles take on a professional track after being involved as a youth? Several of our students go on then to study music. We have several past students. The, the uh, youth ensemble has been in existence since 2002, so we have graduates that are, are fully into their adulthood. We actually had two people who got married from the, the youth ensemble and now have children. We have some who are um, choral teachers. We have some that are in other uh, walks of life. Most of them go on to four-year college and then into usually some other form of a career, but often keeping music as important. Lori, we often hear people say, you know, oh, I, I can't sing. I'm not able to do it. Um, and that might lead to some hesitation in maybe trying out for a singing group. What might you say to someone who has those reservations? I firmly believe that everybody is able to sing. There's only a very small percentage of people who are not able to match pitch. That uh, people who haven't sung or don't think they can sing should absolutely go ahead and try out and, and for a choir and that there's, there's always a choir in any community that will, that will be the right fit for just about anybody who wants to sing. Pam, what is the immense possibility of people coming together to sing? What we hope is that through, through the music that we perform, the rehearsal process that we go through together, that we can build a sense of community, that we can sit, give uh, students and adults alike, this one thing, this lifelong love for music as uh, that, that music will bring us all together. Pam, you've brought five members of the Youth Ensemble to come and perform on the show for us. Can you tell us a little bit about this group and what they're going to be singing for us today? Sure. We have five seniors who are with us today. They are Sarah Nielsen, Claire Anderson, Nathan Case, Tana Garcia, and Matthew McConnell and they will be singing um, Renaissance Madrigal, My Heart is Offered Still to You. Wonderful. Lori, Pam, Cabria, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I would come from class being so upset, and then I would come to chorus, and we would start singing and dancing and shaking your heads, and then I would be better. And now, members of the Rogue Valley Youth Ensemble. My heart is off.
offered still to you. Constancy untrue. I'm a whale. Not to brag, but my brain is really, really big. And I'm a human. My brain is really big too. In fact, us humans are so smart we can drive around in climate-controlled automobiles talking to each other on smartphones from hundreds of miles away while eating food that we didn't have to hunt ourselves on the way to our comfortable homes we didn't even build ourselves. Well, okay, okay. We don't really have cars or stuff like that, and we do have to hunt for our food, so that's kind of a bummer. But we also don't drop bombs on each other, or poison each other with chemicals, or use up all the resources on the whole planet. Whoa, you didn't have to get so personal. I'm sorry, that was rude of me. I just think you can't really judge intelligence by technology alone. After all, what is the wisdom of destroying the very planet you need to survive? I don't want to be pushy or overly sensitive, but I think humans could really learn something from us whales. Alright, I got a little bit of free time here in between my Facebook updates, my Twitter feeds, my blog posts, my downloads. Okay, well, Whales are part of the order Cetacea. This includes all whales, dolphins, and porpoises. The name Cetacea comes from the Greek ketos, meaning large fish or sea monster. There are many types of cetaceans. The humpback whale, blue whale, right whale, bowhead whale, bottlenose dolphin, nar whale, gray whale, orca, spinner dolphin, pilot whale, beluga, harbor porpoise, spectacled porpoise, and of course the great sperm whale, which was hunted for its oil throughout the 18th and 19th and even 20th centuries. I'm sorry about the whaling. Have you read Moby Dick? Well, I uh, started it... Um, but... I... It's okay. I'm told that no human can read the whole thing. Anyways, we understand what you guys are going through because we used to live on land too. Millions of years ago we had hooves and walked around and we were more or less hippos. Finding more food in the sea than on land, we slowly ventured further out into the water and through the magic of evolution certain genetic traits were selected naturally. Goodbye, hind legs. Our bodies became longer and more streamlined. Us cetaceans have lungs for breathing air, give birth, we nurse our young, and we live in family units. You know, we're really not so different, you and I. We both have big brains, a good sense of humor. We like going on vacation in Hawaii. Definitely. We share something else, too. Something more elemental. Deep within both our brains lies an electrically charged cell that processes and transmits information. This is called a neuron. And deep within the anterior cingulate cortex of these big brains is a neuron known as a spindle neuron. This is the neuron that is responsible for compassion and understanding as well as pitch with regard to sound and song. You humans like music, don't you? Yeah, my iPod's on shuffle right now. I've got about 4,000 songs in this one. Mumford Sons, Flea Foxes... Anyways, the fact that both humans and cetaceans make music seems to be the most powerful of all the similarities between our two species. Music is not only a form of communication or entertainment, it's more mystical and unexplainable than that. It's the harnessing of energy waves in a certain frequency range and the organization of that energy into sounds. As Plato said, rhythm and harmony find their way into the inner places of the soul. I think that if humans sang as much as us whales, they could resolve many of the issues that plague them now. I'm not saying the world would turn around overnight, but the beginning of a new consciousness might emerge and allow for drastically different approaches to all issues confronting the human race. Think of wars were resolved through music or long-form song poems explaining the grievances of both sides, let alone the positive impact it could have on interpersonal relationships and conflict resolution on a local or family level. Actually, I do feel a lot more relaxed when I'm listening to music. You should really try to actually have a conversation with someone through song and music alone. 
All right, I'll try it. I'm not saying you humans need to grow fins and move to the ocean. Just try and sing more. Learn the song of the spindle. Not only will it sound wonderful, it just might save the world. And that's it for this edition of Immense Possibilities. You can find out more about the program or send us suggestions at immensepossibilities.org or visit our Facebook page and like and share us there. Thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Golden. Until next time, please do what you can do. Thanks for watching to learn about tonight's Immense Possibility. You can watch any of our past programs anytime at immensepossibilities.org.